right, good morning, Zurich. How is everybody here today? <laughs> Certainly different than Sierra Leone. Right? Um, thank you very much for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to everyone. The microphone's here. Got to turn it on. There you go. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to everybody. I'm not really going to talk about diamonds or price selling. We're going to talk about development. We're going to talk about some of the heavy issues. I apologize that I'm not from the financial world and may not understand, you know, your perceptions. But uh, I think we can lay a trip on it. So fasten your seatbelts because we are going to go pretty fast. Jobs. What did Shake Shake say? He said, give me another NGO, give me another government program. He said, give me a damn job. And he said, fair market value. We're getting screwed on our diamonds. We're not getting a fair price because our environment is controlled. If you talk about development or you're talking about changing the world, governments and NGOs cannot deliver jobs. They cannot deliver sustainable economic environments. They just don't do it. They're nice people. They can't fly 747 jumbo jets, and they can't deliver jobs, and they can't deliver um, economic development that's sustainable. 18%, it used to be 25% of the children in Sierra Leone died before the age of five. The number one concern for diggers is what am I eating tonight? Now don't tell me about mining laws, don't tell me about all kinds of stuff like that when we are living in a world where the guy wants to keep his kid alive. In this room, what wouldn't you do to keep your child alive? Those are the real values of the real world. Oh, we're just going to pass some laws and mining laws and this and that. Excuse me, but it's nonsense in the context of an environment where people are trying to keep their children alive. Laws tend to become evil. If you want to be a legitimate guy in most of Africa, West Africa, where there are diamonds or diggers, and by the way, there's 13 million diggers supporting 100 million dependents. So we're not talking about some kind of little diamond industry, we're talking gold, diamonds, coltan, and your iPhone. So in this kind of environment, all right, they make a law, well, if you want to trade diamonds, you want to buy gold, you have to use the official exchange rate. With the Lebanese guys and the other people out there are just doing the black market rate for 20%. So laws are used to control the environment for the corrupt government officials who are getting the bribes. That's the reality. So when we come at things from the formal sector and we ignore the informal sector, we actually make things worse. The first rule of development, no good deed goes unpunished. The second rule, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, mine and yours. The role of government is problematic. <coughs> governments are fine. Democratically elected governments gave us people like Hitler or Mugabe. What's going on in places like Zimbabwe today? People, governments kill their own people. I think they're talking about Syria, they're talking about this or that. So don't tell me, oh, the rule of law is sacrosanct. That's what's happening. So governments can do good things. But the kind of problems we're looking at needs business, needs another view, needs another world. We said it earlier that the most powerful force isn't necessarily governments, because I guess we play politicians like baseball cards. So, talking about the diamond industry, what we can learn. I was actually in Kimberley, if any of you probably don't know what the Kimberley process is. It was a government international thing for controlling the flow of diamonds. I was in Sierra Leone during the war. Uh, with the State Department sending the U.S. State Department to talk to Fodi Senko, a terrible murder. In any case, governments, NGOs, and the trade work together to create a rule system for the export and the movement of all diamonds around the world. And it was very effective in stopping the War of Sierra Leone. And it helped the, it keep Liberia out of the game. I mean, what's going on is diamonds were being from Sierra Leone. Uh, the airplane was flying from Colombia with uh, tons of cash. They'd arrive in Liberia. They would buy the diamonds in Liberia. Or, you know, exchange the cash in. The diamond airplane would continue to Switzerland. Switzerland would sell the diamonds to the Belgians and the Indians as official sourced in Switzerland. It's amazing. If you go back to the statistics in the late 1980s, late 1990s, when the war was going on, Switzerland was one of the largest exporters of diamonds in the world. <laughs> there are no diamond mines here. So the Kimberley, so, and then, by the way, the money would be used to buy 
buy more guns to enslave more people to dig for more diamonds. So this was a cycle of events. Now don't tell me that diamonds are neutral assets. Okay, it's very simple. You don't take care of them. They can use to kill people. Give your wife a beautiful diamond and don't give her any security and let her walk around with a $20 million diamond in Africa or in I don't know what part of Zurich is so safe in the middle of the night. And don't complain when someone knocks you in the head because that's what you set up. So this whole idea, you'll see, we'll talk about the responsibility of humans. Anyways, it's interesting because the Kimberley process consisted of governments, NGOs, and trade partners, trade, sitting together and singing Kumbaya. And it worked very well for a while because it stopped the war because the United Nations Security Council said we want to stop this war. But what happened? Sierra Leone was a case where it worked Zimbabwe. It was a case where it doesn't work. Because the United Nations Security Council doesn't care if you kill people in Zimbabwe. It's a political agenda. Do not rely on the United Nations to solve problems. You can help. You can use them. They can help you. They're a good cup of coffee in the morning. But they are not ever going to solve the problems of human rights abuses in the world or anything like that. Because it's politicized agenda. So you can tell the Russians and Chechnya. The Israelis with the Palestinians, the Americans with the UNV bombings in wherever Afghanistan, you're going to control the world, you're going to tell us another sovereign nation. So the Kimberley process became a fig leaf, a brainwashing operation. Jewelers and consumers were told, don't worry about the diamonds because it's covered by the Kimberley process. And that's the mother of all evil because the Kimberley process does not relate to human rights abuses or governments killing their own people. So one of the problems in working with governments is that governments are interested in governments, not in human rights, not in business, they're interested in themselves. And they're very powerful. The bigger problem is the fig leaf problem. It's sort of like the president of South Africa telling everybody, don't worry about AIDS, just take a shot. Remember when Zuma did that? Well, that stopped other people from taking medications that would have saved their lives. Same way with the Kimberley process. The diamond industry was put to sleep for many years, and people were getting killed. Now, this isn't a theory of, oh, uh, you know, we want to make a few more money, we want to make more for dollars, and a percentage of this and that. This is people dying. So it has a higher level of awareness. So, limitations of international law versus national laws. Now, the national laws of the United States, what did work? Dodd Frank legislation said, hey, enough. We don't want the coltan from the Congo. We're going to embarrass you if you're a public company. And now all of a sudden everybody's getting ethical. They found religion because the law stuffed it in their face. That's interesting. Because governments can, in fact, affect change if they're the governments of consuming policy. Which takes us to the major point that I'm going to make today, is that you have tremendous power. I mean, you invest in guys are okay, you're cute, you're interesting, but you're not the guys who buy the stuff. But you have tremendous power, I don't deny. We'll talk about that too. So regulating conflict minerals it was fascinating. And then, you know something funny about diamonds and minerals in the West Africa and the East African world? Some of the, see, these diamonds are scattered all over the place. And they just pick them up off the ground. It's amazing. It's been three, 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 two, three meters of the ground. And these people are very poor. And they're manipulated and they're controlled, sometimes by Israel. So what we're finding out is some of these resources are resources that are actually used to fund terrorist attacks. You know, maybe, I don't know if you have a twin towers here yet, but this is the tallest hotel in Zurich. Okay? And bombs go off all the time in different countries. Car bombs. So if you really want to stop terrorism and you're concerned about the flow of money, or maybe the people who are financing the flow of money, you get a lot of government regulations. OPEC says it is illegal to deal with these companies in Zimbabwe. So their products are sanctioned. But in India, oh, these are wonderful products. So what happened is we developed, we developed an environment where, uh, let me say that, okay. We developed an environment, let me jump over here, where we have to differentiate the products. So this diamond is perfectly okay in India. And in the United States, they can arrest you and throw you in jail for funding terrorists. OFAC is the Office of Foreign Asset Control that controls terrorist finance, and I imagine you guys must have heard that. So you have a strange world where the United States, you know, the Kimberley process, everything's okay, and OFAC here saying, I'm going to arrest you. 